I'm going to invite you to take your Bibles or your Bible apps and turn to the Gospel of Luke chapter 14. We are continuing our Just Jesus series, and we're going to be in Luke 14 today. If you don't have a Bible with you or a Bible app on your device, grab one of the Bibles in the seats around you and turn to page 1038, and you will find Luke 14 right there. Uh, while you're turning there, uh, let me just say, uh, if, if for those of you who don't know, I just got back from uh, Mozambique in Southeast Africa. I was there for a couple of weeks. I had a chance to teach about 40 pastors who were finishing up a course, uh, learn how to pastor their churches and to plant other churches. Uh, they kind of graduated and had 40 of their elders with them as we were talking about stewardship and what it means to, to be a servant of Christ and to lead your church to do that. Uh, got to uh, communicate with them that, that Calvary was generous enough to, to donate the money for seven wells that are going to be put in communities. Got to see one of the communities where the wells are going to be put. Actually, f funny enough, several people said, did you help drill a well? And I was like, do I look like somebody who helps drills wells? <laughs> Come on, there's no talent in these fingers. I can't do that. So uh, I got to see, the, and, the, and the, the village that, that I, I went to was so excited. They showed up in mass uh, just celebrating and cheering the fact that, that we're going to put a well there uh, for them. And we're going to be helping thousands of people with fresh water. And here's the, the cool thing is where they put a well, they, they, they build a church. They put a church in there and start a church. And so there's going to be churches started in those communities. And people are going to have that opportunity. So, And by the way, Thank you for being that church that has that heart for people and that generosity, and it's a privilege to be your pastor. Now, the missionary that I worked with in Mozambique, John Dinah, wanted to send uh, greetings to you and tell you a little bit about that, so uh, check this out. Hello, Calvary Baptist Church. My name is John Dinah. My wife, Vani, and I serve in Kitimani, Mozambique, and even though you don't know me, you support me through your cooperative program giving. We serve in Mozambique. We've been here for almost 30 years, and it is a great privilege to be your missionaries here. I want to say thank you to your church for the giving that you have given to us to provide clean water to literally thousands of people. Every well that you have provided, and you've provided seven wells, will serve about 1,000 people. Doesn't mean that it's limited to that, but that many people will be able to drink fresh water in their community, whether they love Jesus or they don't, that every one of them, through the process of installing that well, will be able to hear the message of salvation through Jesus Christ. We will have interaction with their lives. And you guys have made that possible in seven different communities. I would also like to say thank you for allowing Chad to come. You guys have a great pastor. And Chad was able to share God's word specifically on stewardship, but he ministered in a lot of ways to the hearts of our people here. He identified very well with people. They loved him. Uh, you better hold on to him because he was very well accepted here. And I appreciate very much the time that he took away from family and from you. He spoke very highly of his church family. I know he's anxious to get back to you. Thank you for sharing your pastor. We look forward to serving together with you in the future as God opens the doors. I want to send a message back to you saying thank you very much for all of your gifts, your offering, for your loving pastor, and for the ministry that you do in Lake Havasu, Arizona. Thank you. Yeah, that, that whole thing about me, uh, you know, being a Mozambican pastor, that's not going to work so well. Um, I realized early on, that, you know, they worship a little bit differently than we do, and you really can't be a pastor there unless you can dance. So I'm disqualified uh, just for that alone. Hey, have you ever thrown a party and nobody showed up? You ever done that? That's a terrible feeling, isn't it? I mean, you, you spend the day preparing, you clean the house, you fix the food, you get ready, you get all anticipated, you're exhausted about the time you expect people to show up because you've been pouring yourself into this, and then no one comes. Or worse, one person shows up, right? Because that one person shows up and you're like, that's awkward. What do you talk about? You're the only person who didn't have better plans tonight uh, than uh, apparently everyone else did. Uh, Thrown a party and no one came. I did it professionally one time, um, probably more than once. But the one that sticks in my mind was when I was a youth pastor in Georgia. 
and uh, the senior pastor had this idea that we should have a family conference, you know, about marriage and family, you know, the whole weekend long, and we're going to have classes, and we're going to bring in a special speaker, and all this kind of stuff, and, and so he gave it to me to plan it, and I did that. I planned it. I made the arrangements. I got the teachers. I enlisted the child care workers. I took care of the food, did all that kind of stuff, uh, but nobody with influence promoted it. Uh, you know, because the only influence I had as a student pastor was what with who? Yeah, the teenagers. They, you know, I knew their parents needed to come, but, uh, you know, nobody was listening to me. And, and the senior pastor didn't really promote it. And we were planning for 100 to 200 people, and 20 to 30 showed up. Yeah, kind of a disaster. Not a good feeling. By the way, if you've got a story about a party you threw that nobody came to, share it in your life group this week. Or over lunch today. And, and uh, you guys laugh together about it because it's not the end of the world. But today we're looking at a parable that Jesus told that is about a party where nobody came. Luke chapter uh, 14, beginning in verse 12. This is a continuation from uh, verse 1, really, where Jesus is having dinner at a, a Pharisee's house. And he's the guest of honor, sort of. So it goes on and says, Jesus said also to the man who had invited him, When you give a dinner or a banquet, do not invite your friends or your brothers or your relatives or rich neighbors, lest they also invite you in return and you be repaid. But when you give a feast, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed because they cannot repay you. For you will be repaid at the resurrection of the just. When one of those who reclined at table with Jesus Heard these things, he said to him, Blessed is everyone who will eat bread in the kingdom of God. But Jesus said to him, A man once gave a great banquet and invited many. And at the time for the banquet, he sent his servants to say to those who had been invited, Come, for everything is now ready. But they all alike began to make excuses. The first said to him, Well, I bought a field and I must go out and see it. Please have me excused. And another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen, and I go to examine them. Please have me excused. And another said, I have married a wife, and therefore I cannot come. So the servant came and reported these things to his master. Then the master of the house became angry and said to his servant, Quick, go out to the streets and lanes of the city and bring in the poor and crippled and the blind and the lame. And the servant said, Sir, what you have commanded has been done, and still there is room. And the master said to the servant, Go out to the highways and hedges and compel people to come in, that my house may be filled. For I tell you, none of those men who were invited shall taste my banquet. Uh, three distinct thoughts related to this passage that I want to share with you. Uh, they're, they're just kind of different things that, as I read this, came to my mind. First of all is a reminder. Think about those who are overlooked. Think about those who are overlooked. Jesus is at dinner in his honor. Uh, and, and it's a dinner thrown by important, righteous, religious people. And he reminds them to invite some of the overlooked, some of the marginalized, some of the, the unimportant people, some of the outcasts. Now, why does he do that? Well, we all have this problem. And the, and the problem is like this. We're all friendly to our friends. Right? That's why they're your friends, because you're friendly to them, and, and you're friendly to them. And so when you have a party, who do you invite? Your friends, because you like your friends. Most of us don't think about inviting people we don't like to parties. Think about it. It kind of makes sense. Uh, and, and even our families, if we're going to get together with our families, even if we don't like them, right? We still get together with them. It's Thanksgiving. we got to go. Let's go. Even though somebody's going to ruin your Thanksgiving because you don't like your family, but you still go because they're your family. Now, here's the thing. Jesus said, even people who don't know God do that. You know, even people who aren't followers of Jesus, if they're going to have a party, they invite their friends, they invite their family, they get together with the people that they know and they care about. But he's saying, look, if you are a follower of Jesus, if you believe that Jesus is the one and only Son of God and Savior of the world, and you believe that he died on the cross to pay for your sins and was raised from the dead, and you've made a commitment to follow Jesus with your life, then the expectations are different for us. You see, in Jesus' kingdom, we're friendly to everyone. 
not just our families, not just our friends, not just the people who can bless us, but we're friendly to everyone, but especially we're friendly to the friendless, the outcasts, the marginalized, even those who are difficult. And this is kind of hard for us to grasp, but I want you to think about this. I love it when, I, when I'm greeting people before the service and I see you guys come in. I love seeing you guys greet each other. Because a lot of you, you, you got friends and you're catching up and you're, you're shaking hands and you're hugging and you're just so excited to see each other. And that's a beautiful thing. And a lot of you tend to sit in exactly the same places week after week. And you've got a posse around you. Right? They're your people. And you, you greet them and you say, hey, it's great to see you. And when they're not there, you actually notice that they're not there. And that is awesome. But here's what I wonder. Do you ever look around and see the people who are lonely? Do you ever look around and see the people who, who are struggling, who are hurting? Do you, do you ever think about introducing yourself to somebody new and, and inviting them to join you and your group for lunch after service? Is that something that crosses your mind? Because I think that's what Jesus is saying to us. Pay attention to the people on the margins. Pay attention to the people that uh, might really need a friend. Not just the people who are going to reciprocate what you offer them. So here's my reality. Uh, I want Calvary to be that church that cares for everyone. And as pastor, I want to know everyone that comes here. I really can't do that anymore because God has blessed us with lots of people, and, and it drives me crazy. You guys might think I'm okay with it, but it grates on my soul that I look out and I see faces that are familiar, and I know names, and I can't always put names and faces together. And, and it really shows up when we're out in the, the community and somebody says, hey, Pastor Chad, and I'm like, I don't know you. And that, and that hurts me. I, I don't know how to explain it. So I, I just try to be honest and try to go, hey, can you tell me your name again? And, and it really kills me when it's like the fifth time and, and by now I should know. So here's what, here's what I, I, I'm trying to do. Because even though I know it's impossible to know everybody, I'm not going to tr stop trying. Okay? That's just how I'm wired. And, and so myself and the pastors on the, the staff here, we all have time in our week that we schedule to meet new people. And a lot of times that happens really organically, and, and uh, it's not like, okay, I can't do anything else during this time. But, but here's the point. I, we really want to meet people that we don't know. We want to get to know you, find out about your life, hear your story, how God has changed your life. That, that's what we're all about. So uh, and we'd love to help you connect to Calvary Deeper. So here's the invitation. Because all of us tend to eat most days, uh, we would love to take you to lunch or to coffee, or to breakfast, you know, whatever fits your schedule and our schedule. And if you're newer to Calvary, we're going to invite you to call up the church and make an appointment to let one of us, you know, sit down with you and hear your story. Now, here's my caution. Don't be a calendar hog and schedule, you know, lunch with me and Chet and Jesse and O.C. and Robert and do all that kind of stuff. You know, don't do that. Just pick one of us and, and you know, make it work because we want to get to know you, but we can't know everybody. Now, if you're not new to Calvary, and, and you're, you know, and by this I mean, you know, actually there's a pastor who knows who you are, knows your story, can call you by name, uh, knows some stuff about you, then, then sorry, we, we don't necessarily have as much time uh, to do that. But uh, if you aren't new, you've been here a while, there's two thoughts I want to share with you. If you've been here for a while, I dare you to ask someone to lunch or to coffee. Look around you and, and go, hey, you know what? I don't know them, and I've been coming here a while. I'm going to introduce myself and just see if they want to go have coffee. And, I, and to hear their story, you might make some new friends that way. Maybe you see somebody that you, every week, but you don't really know them, and, and you don't know if they have a group, and you want to invite them to yours. I dare you to do that. Secondly, if you've been here for a while, stop parking and guest parking. Uh, <laughs> sorry, just had to work that in, you know. And by the way, I think if you've been here like more than three times, you're a regular, guest parking's off limits. I know some of you are like, well, I'm not going to take intro class because then that means I'm here and then I can't park in guest parking. Come on, let's be honest before God. All right, this is not about me. I'm not sitting out there with a camera taking pictures of your license plates, all right? I'm not doing that, but let's just, you know, honor one another that way. So here's the thing. If we truly want to lead people to a life-changing relationship with Jesus, We've got to see the people on the margins. We've got to be that kind of church. Second thing that uh, I noticed from this passage is the message to the audience with Jesus. 
Uh, this is an incredibly uh, powerful parable that is meant for the people who are sitting at the table with Jesus in that moment. Uh, this was a very specific kind of moment. And we need to understand what's going on there. See, Jesus was at a dinner party and religious leaders surrounded him. Go back to chapter 14, verse 1, and it says, One Sabbath, when he went to dine at the house of a ruler of the Pharisees, they were watching him carefully. So get the setting. Jesus is the guest of honor, but he's the guest of honor because they want to decide if he's okay. They are judging Jesus on whether or not he's worthy to join their group. That's what's going on. Think about that, how ridiculous that is. God in the flesh is sitting there in their midst, and they are judging him. Hmm. So Jesus understands this is going on. They're, they're making it very clear. There's been already some, some conversation about things that he did. But these are people who took great pride in their heritage and in their faith. And one of them toasted the idea that one day they would all enjoy the feast in the kingdom of God. Verse 15, it says, When one of those who reclined at table with Jesus heard these things, he said to Jesus specifically, Blessed is everyone who will eat bread in the kingdom of God. And this guy was basically saying to the people around the table, Aren't we special? Can't you look forward to the day that we're going to dine together in God's kingdom? And Jesus challenged them all, and he told this parable. Now, we read the parable, and, you know, it's about rude guests. But when Jesus is telling this parable, it's basically taking a baseball bat to their preconceived notions of who they are and what's in store for them. I mean, this is not gentle. This is about as confrontational as you can get in a social setting. It, it literally is him blowing up their ideas of who they are. So uh, it's no wonder that, that they got a little bit ticked and wanted to kill him. Uh, because Jesus basically said, don't assume your place at the table. Don't assume your place at the table. Now, the audience that he's talking to, they see themselves as God's chosen people. They are the descendants of Abraham, of Isaac and Jacob. You know, Moses and King David have been their ancestors. And they go, hey, we get the promises of God. We're, they apply to us. We're in no matter what. And the parable challenged that idea. And Jesus warned them, don't treat the invitation casually. Don't treat the invitation casually. Uh, now, here's how this kind of applies. The, the feast that they got ready for uh, doesn't make a lot of sense to us because when we're going to have a party, what do we do? We send out, if you're going to be formal, you're going to send out invitations to say, show up at my place 5 o'clock Saturday. Uh, I can't come because I'm preaching, but uh, that's all right. But, you know, that's, what, that's how we communicate in our age. But they didn't do that then because they had to, like, say, hey, we're going to have a party. So they send out a message to everybody through their servants. Hey, we're going to have a party, uh, and we'll let you know when it's ready. But, but make preparations that you're going to be available to come when the feast is ready because they got to butcher the animals. they got to cook the animals. they got to wait for supplies to arrive on caravans and, and stuff like that. They don't know exactly when it's going to happen. They're just saying, hey, we're getting ready. So the day comes, and the feast is finally ready. All the food's prepared, and all the stuff is ready. Then they send their servants out to let people know, drop what you're doing, and come show up. And then what happens? The servants go out, and somebody goes, oh, hey, I can't come. I just bought a piece of property. I have to go look at this dirt over here to see how different it looks from the dirt I already own. <laughs> hey, I can't come to your feast. I just, I just bought some oxen, and I've got to take them for a test drive. Because you know those oxen dealers. Somebody else, this is completely escapes me. I just married a wife, so I can't come to a party. <laughs> come on, guys. Whose idea is it to go to the parties? Right? Hey, wait, wait. He uses an excuse. And all of them just kind of go, hey, I'm, I'm too busy. I'm too busy. And the host in the story gets upset. Rightfully so. And he tells his servants, hey, you go out and, and get the poor, get the blind, get the lame, get the outcast, get anyone else but these ungrateful intended guests. You see, what Jesus is saying is the party isn't dependent on the guests. This is God's party, and it's going to happen whether you show up or not. 
Um, for the record, we are the ones in the story referred to as the poor, the blind, the lame, and anyone. That's us. That's us. Because God's chosen nation ignored the invitation. Now, understand how, what really happened. There were, there were thousands of Jews that became followers of Jesus Christ. In fact, for the first 50 or so years of the church, the majority of the Christian church was made up of Jewish believers. So many so that, in fact, that the Roman government believed that Christianity was a Jewish cult. They treated it as such. But the religious leaders, the ones that were supposed to represent God to the people, the ones who studied God's word uh, endlessly, they were the ones that when the Son of God was in their midst and right there, they're the ones who said, I'm sorry, I'm too busy protecting my interests. I'm too busy protecting my status. I'm too busy wrapped up in my concerns and in my little empire to come to your celebration. They missed it. And so the master sent his servants to get the outcasts. <laughs> That's us. Aren't you glad you got invited to the party? Aren't you glad you got invited to the party? <laughs> Some of you are. Let's try this again. Aren't you guys really glad you got invited to the party? <laughs> okay. Well, I mean, it's kind of a cool deal. I mean, this is like the party of all parties, and we got invited. We weren't the intended guests, but we're included. We're included. So now let's talk about what this parable means for us. What does it mean for us? Uh, the parable was directly applied to the people who were with Jesus. It was a warning shot across their bow. It was telling them that they thought they were in and they were out. But uh, let's talk about what it means for us now. First of all, Jesus is telling us, don't assume. Don't assume. Don't assume your relationship with Jesus. We talk constantly here about having a life-changing encounter with Jesus. It's about believing and committing and following Jesus. And, and, and we mention that all the time. And our mission is leading people to a life-changing relationship with Jesus through the love of his people and the power of his truth. It, it's all about this relationship with Jesus. And yet I still run into people who are assuming. What do I mean by that? I, I, I ask them questions about their faith story. <laughs> by the way, if you go to lunch with me, I'm going to ask you questions about your faith story. I want to hear it. I want to know about it. How did you end up in this place? And, and yet I still get answers about people who are assuming, well, you know, my, my dad was a pastor. My grandparents were missionaries. Okay. Well, I'm an American. I've always gone to church. Okay. Or, or the, well, I believe. I believe in God. You see, a relationship with Jesus is not a generalization. It's not a label. It's not even a church membership. It's not a heritage. Following Jesus is a life-altering commitment that we make when we realize that without Jesus, we have no hope. We have no hope of forgiveness. We have no hope of eternal life. We have no hope of peace. So don't assume Please be certain that you have a seat at the table. And if you're not certain that you've had a life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ, then please, after the service, talk to, to one of the members of the prayer team. They'll be here across the front. Find one of the pastors at the Connection Centers after the service and just go, hey, I want to know. Tell me more about this life-changing relationship with Jesus. I want to be sure that I have it because we don't want anyone to miss the party. Now, I have to say this because I know there are some of you here that have committed themselves to Jesus 411 times and you're still afraid you're not going to make it to the party. Okay, by the way, um, I'm, I'm just telling you, be at peace. If you've done that, if you're one of those people, uh, because you'll never be good enough to feel good enough. Because it's not about being good enough. It is about God's grace. We are forgiven by grace. It is Jesus' sacrifice on the cross that pays for our sins. It is not our goodness. So you're never going to be good enough to feel good enough about heaven. So just rejoice in God's grace that he gives to us because he says his grace is enough for you. So be at peace. So... 
First of all, we shouldn't assume. And secondly, we should know that you are invited to the party. You're invited to the party. God wants you there. And, and this is so cool. That means that God wants you, and he wants you, and he wants you, and he wants you, and he wants me. He, he wants us. It's not a generalization, you know, like, oh, okay, I want people, and it doesn't really matter which people. No, it's personal. It's kind of like we got the golden ticket. You should feel really special. You're not an outcast anymore. You are wanted and you are included. So do you want to go? You're not going to make excuses then? You're not going to find something better to do? Are you going to accept the invitation? Because if you accept that invitation, then welcome to the kingdom of God. Because the Apostle Paul said, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. You're, you're wanted. You're invited. Isn't that good news? But also know this. If you want to attend the party, it's on the master's terms. The master through the party. The master determines the guest list. The master determines the menu. And the master determines the attire. Um, what do I mean by that? In, in Matthew chapter 22, there is a, a parallel parable. In other words, it's very similar to this one, just a few different details. It's a wedding feast, and, and, uh, and in that wedding feast, when they bring in all the people, they give them clothes to wear. And the master looks out, and he sees one guy at the wedding feast who's not wearing clothes, wedding clothes. He's wearing clothes. He's not wearing the right clothes, okay? And they throw him out of the party. They throw him out. Why? Because he tried to come into the party on his terms and not on the master's terms. And, and if we want to attend the party, if we want to make it to heaven, then we got to do so on God's terms. It's his party. we got to do it his way. And God's way is Jesus. Got to love Jesus. Got to believe in Jesus. Got to follow Jesus. That's it. There's no other way to the party. Jesus is the invitation. And, and I know that bothers some people because some people want to protest and go, can't, can't it be a little bit more inclusive than that? Can't we can it, can it stretch it a little bit? Can't we just make it about faith and about believing in generalities and stuff like that? And the answer is no, we can't. We can't because of what Jesus himself said. John 14, 6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Look, if our Lord and Savior kind of made it that exclusive, then we got to stick with that too. Now remember, everyone who calls on the name of Jesus will be saved. But it's got to be the name of Jesus. There's no other way to the party. And see, that's why the master's servants are so committed to bringing people in to the party. So if you're going to the party, and most of you kind of indicated that you wanted to go to the party, then you're a follower of Jesus. And if you're a follower of Jesus, then you're a servant of the master. And if you're a servant of the master, then you've been sent to bring in the poor and the blind and the lame and pretty much anyone. So who are you leading to a life-changing relationship with Jesus? Now, i got to confess, every time growing up I heard this passage preached, it focused heavily on that whole go out to the highways and hedges and bring in anyone. And every time I heard it, there was a guilt kind of thing, kind of laid it at, on us that as church members that we had this responsibility, this, this burden that we had to carry. We had to just like go out and compel people and grab people and, and drag them into church whether they wanted to come or not. <laughs> that was kind of the picture that I got. And, and as I've shared before, you know, it's, it, w it wasn't one that was compelling. And most people didn't even try uh, because no one was bringing their friends to church. And so a lot of times I'd bring my friends to church and they didn't like it. And, uh, and it was tough. But I want you to think about this. Jesus tells a story equating the kingdom of God with a party. Think about that. The kingdom of God is a party. And we've all said that we wanted to go to this party, didn't we? Aren't you glad you were invited to the party? 
And you're all like, yeah, we're, we're glad we're invited to the party. So get this, we're going to a party, and it's the coolest party ever, and the, the host of the party has told us, you can bring anyone you want. You can bring anyone you want to the party. Now think about this. If you're getting invited to a really cool party and you can bring your friends, what are you doing right away? Hey, I got this invite to the friends. You're calling up your friends going, hey, let's go to the party with me. That's going to be cool. Right? It's not difficult to do that. It's not hard to do that. In fact, it's hard to keep you from doing that. You know, just come on to the party. Let's go. It's going to be great. And all of us have friends that qualify in the description that Jesus says to invite, right? We all got friends who are poor. Heck, most of us are blind. <laughs> you guys look good this way. <laughs> and definitely we all have friends that are lame. So, uh, hey, I'm just using his words, that's all. You see, why is it so hard? We're going to the greatest party ever thrown and all Jesus said is, bring your friends and your family with you. They're all welcome. Let's fill this place up with all that God has to offer. That's it. So I'm definitely wanting to go to the party, and I hope you are too. And I want to bring as many people with me to the party because that's what God wants as well. How about you? Let's get them to the party. Will you pray with me?